Welcome Wargamers, this is Doug with 2 Plus Tough, and today we are talking all about the Seraphon in the new General's Handbook. Okay. Now before I begin, I want to say that I did a review of the Star Collecting Box uh, before this came out. Uh, you can find that up here on the link down below, which everyone pops up for you. Um, basically, we just looked over at the, the Star Collecting Box contents, different ways you can build the Big Beastie in there, and gave some ideas of where you can go forward. This is really going to be an, an addition or addendum to that video, where we kind of talked about the flavor of the army already, and like its kind of strengths and weaknesses in general. So this is going to be, like I said, adding to that. The way that I've been doing these videos has been um, talk about the overarching allegiance abilities, take a quick break, we'll come back, we'll talk about um, command traits, which is going to be a little bit different for this one, uh, and then coming back at the end and talking about artifacts and then synergies based on kind of how this thing can go, right? what these allegiance abilities mean for the army. So we're going to kick it off with their first allegiance ability called Masters of Order. Basically what this does, it has two real effects and one of them is that a, um, a slon, a mega wizard, I don't know what they are for their army, um, he can dispel anywhere on the battlefield not just within 18 inches. So he has infinite range on his dispel abilities which is incredible. Right? It really solidifies the idea that they are masters of magic and I really really appreciate that. Now in addition to that, um, if they roll a double for a casting uh, and it, the spell still goes off, uh, they get an extra six inches to the range, no matter what spell it is. Keep in mind that uh, if you say, say this spell's casting value was five, and you roll double ones, it fails. It just fails because they didn't get enough. Um, but if you were to say roll, what, three and three, so it's six, you can pass the spell and their doubles, so now whatever it was has six inches to its range. Also keep in mind, and this is kind of a, a note that was brought up to me by a TO, um, and that was, the rules for dispelling include being able to see the model. So this kind of lifts the barrier for range. However, the Slon still has to see the model in order to dispel it. Now this shouldn't be a huge problem. He's kind of like up there on a pedestal. As long as you're not hiding him too harshly behind a building, uh, he should be able to see just about everything. Next up is the Lords of Space and Time. Uh, this functions a lot like summoning, which is kind of their thing, um, but is very, very interesting. So what that basically means is once per turn, you pick a unit, and you pick them off the table, okay? They can be in combat, they can be near a board edge, they can be deplete, almost depleted, completely, whatever, doesn't matter. Pick them up off the table, and then you roll a die. On a one, they just stay in that little off-realm area. On a two through five, they come back just like they were summoned, which is nine inches away from any enemy, and they have already counted as moving for that phase. So, like I said, it's just like summoning. What you're really doing is repositioning them across the battlefield. Now on a six, on that die roll, you get to place them just like you were summoning. However, they can still move in this turn, which is phenomenal, right? <laughs> that's pretty dope. So that's pretty, uh, oh, that makes you want to do it quite a bit. So a lot of people were kind of disappointed with this, kind of got deflated. They're like, oh, well, I could already summon things. Why would I do this? There's a lot of utility in it. One, there's no range on it. This is not a spell, you just pick them up. And sure, there's a 16% chance of failing, uh, but there's a higher chance of failing a lot of spells out there, so whatever. Second, uh, I think it's the same kind of thought process that we had when we were like, why would anyone ever do something? It's simply because we used to view it as a army increasing um, ability, meaning like your army gets physically bigger. But really what Age of Sigmar has made summoning is um, movement, positioning, uh, just location, like literally on the battlefield of where your forces are. So it's like a movement shenanigan rather than uh, an army-wide, you know, increase. And this is what that is. Remember, a lot of the Seraphon stuff has movement shenanigans, like the Sauruses have double time, um, chameleon skanks can blend in with scenery, things like that. There's all kinds of stuff. So this kind of adds to that theme. And as we get down a little bit further, it can do quite a bit. Remember, you can use your huge chaff unit of skinks to run up there, tie up enemies, and then when your rest of your force is in a good position, just pull them out, and then you charge in with everything else. You can do quite a bit of nasty stuff with this. And so that's really those two things are the allegiance abilities for the army. Um, dispelling anywhere on the table, as long as you can see them, and then also uh, movement shenanigans with uh, Lord's based on time. Now we're going to transfer kind of into the command abilities, which are very unique for the Seraphon. Uh, and that's simply saying that 
there's three command ability profiles, one for a Slon, one for a Saurus, and one for a Skink, and they each have three options available to them. So we're going to kick it off with the Slon ones here. Arcane Might. Reroll rolls of one when making casting or unbinding rolls for the general. So if your general is a Slon, they get to reroll casting and unbinding, things like that. It's very, very simple, very straightforward. Written kind of funny. I don't really like that. <laughs> Think about that one for a second. Um, but it's very, very clear. I mean, you're doing a lot of summoning and, and spell stuff. I'd imagine that'd be very, very useful. Vast Intellect. The general can use the Curse of Fates and Summon Starlight spell from the Skink Star, Star Seer and Skink Star Priest War Scrolls. Besides being a mouthful, I'm not sure of the validity of that one. By that I mean like how useful it's going to be. Um, if you are a Seraphon player and you get good use out of those spells, leave in the comments down below what you like to use them for. I'm very curious about that. These spells don't really stand out to me. But, that being said, if you are a heavy Slon user, this just puts two more spells in your arsenal to use. Great Rememberer. If the general is still alive, you can use the Lords of Space and Time battle trait twice in each of your hero phases rather than one. This is where I think the money is. Um, not only are you doubling down on movement shenanigans that you get natively just by being Seraphon, but you're also having a bigger presence on the battlefield by dictating where your opponent is fighting. Like I said earlier, if the unit's in combat, just scoop them up. Now, keep in mind that the more you do this, the higher likelihood is you're going to be rolling ones when you redeploy them. So you need to be very tactical in how you do this. Don't just do it because you can. Think about everything you want to do. Get position, the units in position to counterattack and, and charge and things like that. Be very, very um, thoughtful of it. However, being able to do this twice is pretty momentous. And remember, just like doing it more increases your chance of rolling a one, it also increases your chance of rolling a six, which is pretty cool too. So now we're going to move into the Saurus command traits. Discipline Fury. You can re-roll one failed hit roll for the general in each combat phase. Okay. Thickly Scale Hide. You can re-roll save rolls of one for the general. It's not bad. Uh, a lot of the Saurus stuff, they have great saves. There's just not a lot of re-roll save mechanics in the army, so if you... Especially if you have one of those ones who's like on a big dinosaur up there in combat, he's going to be absorbing damage. It's really good to have. Mighty War Leader. The general can use the Inspiring Presence command ability in the same hero phase that they use one other command ability. Being able to use more than one command ability is actually one of my favorite things in the game, right? Just because you can do so much. Uh, keep in mind just a few things. You cannot use Inspiring Presence twice. It says you can use Inspiring Presence plus something else. So you are still going to want to focus on the actual General's command ability to get the most out of this. If you're choosing a Saurus unit that has a very meh, you know, crummy command ability or one that you just simply don't make the most use of in your armies, you're not going to see the benefit from this. And lastly, we're going to move into the Skinks. Master of Star Rituals. If the general is a skink priest, they can use the Celestial Rites ability from their war scroll twice in each of their hero phases rather than once. If they're not a skink priest, they can use the Celestial Rites ability. That's okay. Celestial Rites isn't my favorite thing. Um, but, you know, it has its uses in the army, and especially if you want to stay thematic. I like the idea that you can take... And they kind of introduced this in the General's Handbook 2017 in general, which is a lot of the stuff says if you take a, you know, a priest or a wizard they get buffed. And if you take someone who's not, then they can be a wizard or a priest. And I think that's a cool thing. So now you can take, you know, just a normal skink hero of any kind and not miss out on these star priest things. Nimble, add one to the general's move characteristic. In addition, add one to save rolls for the general as long as they are not riding upon a mount. Yeah, I mean, it's good. It makes them, uh, I guess, a little more survival, a little less squishy. Uh, but for being such a squishy type general army, if you're going for a full skink theme, uh, I think you're kind of already in the mindset prepared for that. And the last one is Cunning. Roll a dice at the start of the combat phase. The general is in three inches of an enemy hero. On a four or more, the enemy hero suffers one mortal wound. Now, here's the thing. If you're using an all-skink army, awesome for you, because skinks are really cool and I like them. They're usually beautiful uh, when painted well. If your general is within three inches of an enemy hero, either things are going so well that you are just wiping the floor and there's really... Who cares? Or things are going so horribly bad that it, this is not going to help, <laughs> frankly. Um, so I kind of don't see the point of it. Skink heroes, they're kind of like goblin heroes in the sense that they are just 
you can crush them just with the just by looking at them wrong, right? Um, so kind of limited use on that. I really think that Nimble is probably the best one of these, doubling down on being small and fast and squishy and things like that. Things that the army already is if you're going with a skink theme thing. So keep that in mind. Stepping back and looking at the command traits as a whole, I think even if you wanted to take a skink themed army, taking a slon is always going to be a good choice. It just is. Um, between um, the lords in space of time and being able to dispel anywhere on a table, remember that's just a slon thing is, is the dispelling anywhere. It's not Seraphon wizards. So it has to be a slon, which is very, very interesting. Um, I think that though the model of the Slon is going to always be the centerpiece of a Seraphon army. Obviously it doesn't have to be, but I really think thematically it is. And I really think that these traits go to support that. Being able to do, you know, your re-rolling ones to cast and unbind, and then also the Lord Space of Time twice, it, it means a lot when you're on the battlefield. Frankly, I think the Skink one, they got shortchanged a little bit. There could have been some cool stuff. Even if it was just like, I don't know, reroll ones to hit, you know, I mean, it's not a massive command ability, but it would sure, I don't know, be better. <laughs> and so, um, as far as command ability goes, I'm not really blown away by them. All right, so next we're gonna move into the artifacts, which are gonna be pretty short and sweet. They, I don't know, I wasn't really terribly blown away by them, but let's get started. Zodiac Dial, roll a, di roll a dice at the start of the first battle round. In the battle round corresponding to the number you roll, you can re-roll failed save rolls for this model. On a roll of a six, you decide which turn this ability goes off. No, I don't, I don't dig that. <laughs> I don't like artifacts that are still so random. I don't mind if it's like D3 damage, but I like, you take an artifact, so you use up your one artifact thing per battalion to roll a die, and then you get re-rolls of save rolls for that town. But I mean, I don't, I don't know, like, if you roll a 1, it's useless, because how many people are going to shoot at your hero in the back turn 1, okay? Um, if you roll a 6, you can choose, but how do you really know where things are going to go? I just don't see a lot of use for it. Incandescent Rectuses. I think it's how you pronounce it, I have no idea. Roll a dice the first time this model suffers its final wound. On a roll of a 1 or 2, it's slain. On a roll of a 3 or more, this model heals D3 wounds instead. If the model is not slain, remove for the battlefield and set it up again within 12 inches of its original location, more than 3 inches away from enemy models. If this is impossible, the model remains in its current location. Now, this is the Ring of Immortality from what used to be the Von Karsteins of the uh, Vampire Universe uh, in Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Basically, if you die on a 3-up, you come back to life. Now, interesting though is that it doesn't say this does not cost command, uh, points in match play, whereas everything else does in this book now. So you, I assume, will have to pay for this to set your hero back up. Now, if you're doing something like, say, a skink army, and you left just a few command points available, this is not going to be a huge tax for the amount of benefit that you get. If it's a heavy hitter, you know, a huge beast or whatever, this is going to be a lot. And so it kind of very much depends on your army composition and how you want to go for that. Blade of Realities. Pick one melee weapon that the bearer can use. Increase the rend characteristic of the weapon by one. It's good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, if you have a Saurus-themed army, or it's just a Saurus hero, it doesn't be a general, um, then they can get a lot of work out of this for sure. Light of Dracothian. Once per battle, the bearer can automatically unbind one spell cast by an enemy wizard within 18 inches. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Adds a little bit of dimension to your... Um, Masters of Order thing, so it doesn't have to be a slon, and it's auto pass. You still have to be within 18, inch, inch, 18 inches. Um, I imagine you still have to be line of sight, but it's auto pass, so I'd ask your opponent about that one first. Um, really, what it does is if you don't want to take a slon, it's a great option to have. If you want to take a skink uh, hero or a themed army or Soros army, don't have a slon, uh, it's a great way to add that little bit of anti magic tech to your army. The Coronal Shield. At the start of any combat phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit within three inches of this model. On a roll of a four or more, that unit is blinded. Subtract one from the hit rolls of a blinded unit for the rest of the combat phase. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, anytime you can debuff your opponent, I would say definitely be on the lookout for ways to stack that debuff with other things. Um, but that was pretty cut and dry. Prism of Amentok. 
you can unleash the power of the prism at the start of your movement phase. If you do so, this model cannot move in the movement phase. Pick an enemy unit within 12 inches of this model. On a roll of three or more, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. It's, it's okay. I mean, um, if you know that your hero is not going to be in combat that turn or looking to be in combat, so you have like a Saurus warrior who's near the front lines but is not necessarily in combat at that moment, um, yeah, that's a great thing. Just shave off a few wounds here and there. Um, I mean, if you have no other interests in any of the other artifacts, it's a no-brainer just because there's nothing wrong with the ability to kind of hurt somebody. So keep that in mind. That's pretty cool. And so that wraps up kind of the coverage of the Allegiance abilities. I'm not going to go into the Battalion simply because, one, one of them doesn't make any sense, and two, um, I never have points change, army composition changes, things like that. I'm just not really into Battalions very much. Um, but, going back to the Allegiance stuff, uh, what you really get is it kind of funnels you into you kind of want to slot for a, a general. If you don't, there are some cool other options, but you have to be very keen about how you stack synergies and things like that. So I, what I would say is, if you're a new player, uh, and I think I said this with the store collecting box reviews, just get a slon. Just start there. Learn the army. Learn what those other generals do before you start investing. Like, don't just walk up and say, I want a skink army, right? And just out of nowhere. Like, try the slon at least. See what he offers the army, because everything else is going to be, like, on hard mode. So, kind of get used to that in your mind. If you bring a slon, then you're unlocking the potential of the Masters of Order part where you can dispel things from any distance, and that is a huge asset to this army, especially when it comes to um, making yourself the dominant magic army, and that's really, really an asset. Likewise, if you do take a slon, um, maximizing your use of the Lords of Space of Time ability is going to be clutch to this army. Keep in mind that you can use it even if you don't have a slon for a lord. Um, Lords of Space and Time does not actually specify that you have to have a slon. It mentions in the fluff blurb that slon do it, but it doesn't say that this army on the battlefield right now has to have a slon in it to do that. So you can have a Saurus army where it redeploys one unit. Um, maximizing that is, I think is going to be the crux of Seraphon going forward. By that I mean having your say, skink chaff units that run up there and tie up things, um, putting your big beasts and Saurus warriors into position, then you pull out the skinks and then charge forward with everything else. At that point, it doesn't really matter if the skinks come back that turn. You can roll a one on that ability and it's fine. Or, likewise, you can redeploy them and put them behind the enemy, and so now they have a double threat. Sure, skinks aren't very scary, but they mean a lot when they're behind your enemy lines tying up a hero or a sorcerer or something like that. If you were a Warhammer Fantasy Battle player and you played Seraphon, this is going to be very, or I guess Lizardmen back then, um, this is going to be very, very different. You've got to learn that movement and being cagey is going to be the absolute key going forward. These guys have never had the best synergies. They never had any rock hard thing that you're like, whoa, that's broken. Um, none of that stuff. So what this is gonna be is maximizing the things that you do have and trying to minimize the weaknesses of the army, which typically is things like, there's not a lot of rerolls to save rolls. Um, you don't have exceptional units at any one thing. You have a lot of great generalists. And so kind of moving those things around, like movement shenanigans are gonna be the key here. Also, there's a huge psychological game to play here. Like our example earlier, right? You pull the skinks out, you charge forward with fresh troops hitting the enemy's depleted units, and then dropping that unit of skinks down behind the enemy. Um, it does something to your opponent, right? It can put them on tilt, is what it's typically called, but they kind of go, whoa. Um, they kind of get freaked out because what you're doing is presenting too many threats for them to deal with. It doesn't matter, really, what happens to the skinks in the back. They've done their role. They've held back the enemy so that your units can get into a better charge position. That's all they needed to do. So anything they do on top of that is going to be freaking cherry on top. And if it means that the Chaos Sorcerer back there like shoots them instead of a unit in the front, that's a win, right? Anything that they do to deal with the skinks in the back is going to be a win compared to putting all that pressure on the front line. Keep in mind that you're throwing people around as if they were spells, but they're not, and you're dispelling everything that the Slon can see, which is awesome. And so you're kind of, you, you, what you can do is make your opponent feel, feel is the key word, like their options are very limited. And that's the key to putting someone on tilt, and not that I, I mean, don't like, 
don't verbally be like, man, you're hosed, right? What I'm saying is that by pressing in on what this army is good at, it can make some opponents not know what to do. And while it does sound very gamey, um, I think that it's very thematic actually. And, and here's what I mean. You have these stories of like people fighting the Seraphon and there's just monsters and stuff just appearing all over the place. That's because the Slon's remembering them and bringing them to the battle. And that's essentially what you're doing. You're popping up your army and moving them in weird ways that shouldn't be happening for the express purpose of disorienting your opponent and then snapping the trap and getting them. So I can't stress enough, explain all this to your opponent beforehand as far as like the movement abilities and things like that. Um, don't give them a bad game experience. It's not what I'm saying. People take the term like on tilt very, very uh, harshly and I don't mean it that way. I simply mean that um, you can put so much force forward that your opponent kind of doesn't know where to direct its attacks and so target priority suffers, things like that. And so that is how you can make a path to victory. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful to you. You can go check out the Star Collecting Box review for the Seraphon and also a lore video that I did for them a while ago at the links down below. If you have thoughts on how to play Seraphon in uh, the new General's Handbook edition, go ahead and leave it in the comments down below. I read all of my comments. I pin very, very useful ones to the top so that new players can get good information. Please do that. I love seeing it and the community we've built here has been awesome. Thank you guys so much for watching and happy wargaming.